Hey, welcome to the, my, my show, the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevan Davani, the Total Connector. I couldn't be more timely than now uh, after the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, went on public TV on 60 Minutes and when asked, uh, where does the money come from? He, you know, with a straight face said, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we print the money digitally. We as a central bank have the ability to create money. Uh, so, um, um, Stephanie von Jan and Emil Sandstedt are going to be my special guest today and hope you're going to enjoy this interview, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, you can check out her article on medium.com. I was going to put that in the show notes. The title is Money Creation, the Fiat System, a Balance Sheet Analysis of Central Banks and Banks. And uh, Emil Sandstedt, uh, really great, I mean, extremely knowledgeable uh, his his book is called Money Dethroned, The Historical Journey, must read on Amazon as Kindle and paperback. And yeah, uh, so what we're going to talk about, like, you know, fundamental questions uh, for all the people, like, what is money? Where does it come from? How is money created at central banks and banks in the process of both credit creation and asset purchase uh, discussion with a fiat money is debt or money and reconciliation of both fiat money versus debt money. Is it debt? Is it what? Uh, fiat money as a debt system. And yeah, and a, you know, a spectrum of other uh, really overdue questions that we need to discuss today. And hope you're gonna enjoy this. Please like it, retweet, reshare, subscribe, please. Would help me enormously. And thanks so much for your support and for your help. Without further ado, this is my talk with Stephanie von Jan and Emil Sunstead. Okay. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Navani. My very special guests are Stephanie von Jan and Emil Sunstead. Uh, it couldn't be timelier. Uh, first of all, welcome to the show. How are you guys doing? Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. I'm good too. Thanks for um, inviting me and thank you, Emil, for joining as well. I'm very curious on your ideas and on our conversation. Definitely. I have a couple of, uh, of uh, points, so I'm sure we will be having some discussions later on. Cool. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, the topic of our discussion or actually uh, in connection with your recently published article, Stefan Ivan, uh, um, what's the exact title? Mo money creation uh, of the uh, in the fiat system. Yeah, exactly. So how banks and central banks essentially create money, and um, as I see it, this is really absolutely important to finally grasp how banks and central banks create money out of thin air. Um, to really understand how the whole system works, because this is kind of the base for everything, and this has so many implications and. When, when someone really grasps how this works, then everything else follows. Mm -hmm. And it couldn't be, you know, more timelier than ever because <laughs> the Fed chairman, I mean, it's, there's no coincidence, the Fed chairman, uh, Jerome Powell, uh, went on public uh, TV or on 60 Minutes and he was asked by the moderator journalist, you know, where, where does the money come from? And of course, I mean, with a you know very straightforward manner, as if it's like the most natural thing to say, is like, um, uh, at least my, it was my impression, you know, uh, is that he said, well, we we print it digitally. Uh, we as a central bank have the ability to create money, so it's it's as if it's taken for granted. Uh, what do, what do you say to this to this kind of of, of attitude or, or behavior? I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I have a part in my, um, in my article that discusses exactly this from an Austrian perspective. So Rothbard was talking about this, um, how, how credits are given out um, in, during the gold standard. You find it in the section, the process of money creation through credit creation at commercial banks. And um, here it just shows that when there was like gold in there they could like lend out this gold but what happened is that they created so-called pseudo warehouse receipts so they created more money than there is actually backed and then they were giving this out you when when they were giving out a credit 
And um, Rothbard said very nicely, I would like to um, quote him here, it is in fact difficult to see the economic or moral difference between the issuance of pseudo receipts and the appropriation of someone else's property or outright embezzlement or more directly counterfeiting. And now it comes. Most present legal systems do not outlaw this practice. In fact, it is considered basic banking procedure. And this is where we're in right now. So they are considering it a basic banking procedure and this would have been outlawed uh, just a few um, century, centuries ago. And um, during my analysis, I actually found out that they're not only creating new money when they're giving out credit, but also when they are buying assets. And this <laughs> was really uh, also another level. So they don't need to have any funds to buy stocks, but they just create it out of thin air and place it into the account of the seller. And um, what my article is also very much about is how it works from a balance sheet perspective. Because in accounting, you always need two entries. And so you can see very easily what is happening in the balance sheet, what is just happening in this whole process. And um, yeah, I lay this out and I also added some very nice figures for those who were uh, reading the first version. The figures were not in there yet, but I added them. And I also added a section on the statement of central banks and banks on money creation. And they're directly supporting um, what I found out. And actually they went even further with uh, money created with asset purchase. And uh, it's not only one central bank who was publishing that, but also another one, it was the German and the English central bank. So yeah, we can assume that this is true. I mean, they know how it's working, the, the system. Uh, but it's not, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I have a couple, just of a couple uh, paragraphs, uh, which I highlighted for myself to ask you in the process of our discussion. But, um, um, uh, Emil, why don't you just go ahead and, you know, ask your questions or, you know. Yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's a mix of questions and, and points that we can just discuss. It's not that I disagree, but... Uh, you know, I approach this article from uh, more of a beginner's perspective. My focus has always been uh, primitive monies and uh, metallic monies. So I'm not at all an expert in this modern central banking system. <clears throat> so I, I first would like to say that I, I really like the article, Stephanie's article. Um, I like that it stresses in the beginning, it stresses that money is the, it's what makes division of labor possible as uh, as uh, <clears throat> The, the classical economists pointed out. And th when this division breaks down, when money is being tampered with so much that the division breaks down, that's extremely, extremely uh, dangerous for, uh, for society. Because that's when you ba basically have to start to bother with each other, with, which is highly inconvenient. Mm -hmm. uh, so I like that Seth this out, that, that money is the only thing that makes division of labor possible. I also like that uh, Stephanie made the connection between, uh, if, if you think about the balance sheet of, of uh, the Federal Reserve, you have the assets, you have the liabilities, and you have small post capital. I see capital as uh, equity. In, in general accounting, it's called equity. The equity post or the capital post in the Federal Reserve is very small because they, they empty it every week and send the, 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 they send the profits to, uh, to the treasury. So to the government every week. This, when Stephanie points out this, this is the clear Seneros connection. Any profit that is made in by the Fed is sent every week to the government. So, and this was in the in the Federal Reserve's own balance sheet, where they clearly state that this is the one revenue stream of the government. So this I really like. And uh, one thing that I was thinking about when I read the article was that. <clears throat> Uh, we are talking about if money is printed from thin air or not. Or, uh, Stephanie, you are talking that money is pr printed from thin air. I had this view as well, but I recently ran into a kind of counterpoint to this. It's a guy named uh, Manuel Colavea, 
on Twitter. He's an Austrian economist, and he uh, referred me to uh, a quite famous Spanish Austrian economist called Carlos Bondone. And these guys, they're Austrians, but they uh, they argue that money, that US dollar, for example, is credit and it's not money. So they get quite triggered, I would say, when people say that you print money from thin air. It's rather that they see it as <clears throat> you issue currency from thin air uh, or you, you issue uh, credit. So they see US dollar as credit. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, this, is, this uh, matters a bit because when Imagine the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. When they issue more US dollar, they add it on the assets and they match it on the liabilities. They don't put it immediately under capital versus uh, assets. So uh, in an on an accounting basis, I do think that they also treat the US dollar as credit in this manner as well. Now, this doesn't mean that we always have to trust them. They can say that it's credit, the Federal Reserve. That doesn't mean that you always should take their word for it. But uh, uh, I just thought this was interesting that that they treat it as the issue credit. Mm -hmm. And uh, Stephanie also has a quote in the article. It's uh, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve notes are obligations of the United States government. This also is a little bit little hint of it, when something is an obligation that can be seen as uh, as credit also. Mm -hmm. Okay, just just to get to my point, uh, what I want to discuss more, it's when the Federal Reserve, for example, when they issue this currency, they make purchases with it. They, for example, purchase uh, government bonds from the, from the US Treasury, uh, sometimes through the intermediary commercial banks. But when they, when they purchase the government bonds, that, then there, it is already built in into the system. Since they own the bonds, the, the, the debtor has to pay back the money, right? So when you... When they issue the, the US dollar, US dollar is then sent out to the economic system and, and the Federal Reserve gets the bonds. The, one can then imagine that these added US dollars create in quite high inflation into the economy. But since they purchase bonds, it is implicitly stated that the, United, that the US dollars is going to come back through payments and then through the principal when, when, the, when the bond is you know, cleared fully when it's paid back. And when they get this US dollars back, those dollars are then destroyed in the economy. So I think this is, this is one of the reasons I think that we don't see the extreme inflation that one could imagine if they actually printed money from thin air. Um, we see asset inflation, but we also see decreases in prices. For example, oil has crashed and, and certain commodities. So I don't know, I just thought this, uh, this explanation from this branch of Austrians, they were, it's quite good to understand why we can see falling prices today, despite uh, US dollar being added to the economy. And uh, one last thing, it's when, when the payments back to the Federal Reserve, when they stop coming, when people default on the loans or when governments default on their, on their bonds, that's when the US dollars that, that was you know, created from thin air and, and sent into the economy, that's when they have no place to go back to be destroyed. They are stuck in the economy forever. And I think that sounds logical to me. That's when the inflation will happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, very good outline. So this is exactly how it is from a little bit of a different perspective. But um, so what I intended with this article is to make it the most easy to understand and to make this like bridge between um, like how the Austrian economist um, saw it from a whole perspective and what we have now. And you are actually going like one step further, which is exactly true as well. So our system now is not based on anything, anything actually. It's kind of only the obligations of the governments, which is the future tax payments. This is what it is based on. And this is kind of a credit. So you are right with that, definitely. And on the other side, yeah, you can differentiate um, between different uh, monetary, different definitions of money in the central banking system. So we have the monetary base, we have M1, M2, M3, and then you have the counterpart, and they call the counterpart the credit that banks give out. So yeah, this is exactly true what you're saying. 
But what I wanted to like, I just wanted to lay this out because when you are like getting a credit, you can use this credit to buy something and to get um, and to invest. So it is a form of money in our system. So um, both, both views are correct. And uh, what is absolutely important to understand is that our whole financial system right now is based on debt. So first we have the central bank um, reserve notes that are actually an um, obligation um, so that the government has to pay it back uh, with, the, with the taxpayers' money. So yeah, we have this part. Um, but this is considered as the base money and they consider the central banking money it's actually the up and the highest in the hierarchy of monies let's say and then you have you're going more and more down in this hierarchy and the money that is created with commercial banks when they make new credit this is like the counterpart of money but essentially this, these are definitions and you said already that the central banking money could be defined as a as a debt as well and that's uh, definitely valuable valid to say. So um, yeah, that's that's exactly true and that's a, a very good view on that. But yeah, um, I would also like, yeah, this is kind of in the middle. It brings this like view on Austrian econo economies um, from the gold standard. Then you have like my article which considers the step form also as a form of money because you can pay things with that. And then you have this form, okay, everything is essentially debt. And this is also true. Uh, Amit, look, uh, the, the reason I brought you guys together is uh, you're the author of, you know, the, the book Money Dethroned, The Historical Journey. Uh, what consequences will you face when strangers suddenly mass produce your money or when the authorities whose very job it is to preserve monetary integrity choose to pursue debasements in tinkering? And I thought that the two of you would, you know, would complement one another uh, because, uh, you know, um, it's about the question, especially for the average person out there, like, what are the consequences? Who pays the cost? At what costs? And as you, you know, uh, um, 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 as you, Stephanie, also pointed out in your article by screenshotting uh, the, um, uh, a document, Federal Reserve System after 50 years by the Committee on Banking and Currency, which was presented to the Congress in 1964. It says here, uh, when you can read it for yourself, um, but it says here in the end, uh, the, uh, the last sentence is, in each case, government obligations are used. The net result is that the taxpayers are paying for the use of their own credit. Mm -hmm. So it's so the taxpayer is actually always the collateral. Yeah. Right. And uh, I would like to add, I think this is especially true right now, because I was describing this version of uh, US dollar as credit and so on. and. That's when the Federal Reserve is buying, you know, high quality or quote unquote high quality government bonds. But now they are buying other assets as well. They can buy, uh, uh, you know, uh, ETFs that are based on uh, almost junk bonds. So the higher default risk the underlying securities have, the more inflation we will see because when things default, that's as I as I have understood it at least, then the money have no way to come back to the Federal Reserve where they get destroyed again. They will stay, they, they will get an immortal life out in the economy. And when the monetary base uh, is growing because you have these uh, US dollars that will not come back to where, where it was once created, when that base is growing, that is inflation. Um, so just because, uh, I just want to point that out, just because uh, some people might see US dollars as credit. It doesn't mean that the Federal Reserve cannot destroy things. They can for sure um, des destroy everything if they uh, if they mismanage it. And I think there's no reason at all to, to trust them in this uh, manner because right now they buy a lot of different securities um, and we don't know which will default and not in the future. Yeah. Yeah, we're just um, um, right now showing on, on live uh, streaming the U.S. money stocks. It was posted by Thorsten Porleit, Dr. Thorsten Porleit, the Austrian economist. Uh, U.S. money stocks, right, Sharp? Let me, you can see literally it's a, the 90 degrees vertical uh, trajectory. Do you want to comment on that? Like, what, 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 what does it mean? What does it mean for people out there when you see, you know, a, a straight shot, a straight arrow like that? Oh, uh, me or Stephanie? Any, anybody, any of you. Uh, yeah. 
No, I, I try. I think you should be very wary when you see these things. We cannot assume that this money is going to come back to the Fed and get destroyed. <clears throat> That's uh, they, they push the can down the road in a sense. Some parts of this money supply will come back. They will, it will get destroyed because not all debt is bad, um, but you know, some will not. And then that's stuck in the economy. And then that, that will be US dollars floating around, extra US dollars that were not there before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I also think that the money that was uh, created in this debt creation, or, or let's say this debt money as you, as you want to call it, um, it will not be all paid back. And I mean, they're already talking about just cutting debt so this is then truly money created out of nothing when the debt is eventually cut, yeah. yeah. So I mean, um, you can also see at like some graphs how much more debt we have now and it's also it's just like increasing incredibly. Yeah, and we have for example the Bank of Japan, they are buying equity. I think they, they own a considerable part of the whole equity market in Japan. So. If companies go bankrupt, that has the same effect. Suddenly you have printed the Japanese yen out in the system that will not come back because the only way for, for the Bank of Japan to actually destroy their, their money again to, cause, uh, to not cause inflation, that's to sell some of their assets in the future. But they issued uh, the currency from thin air, they purchased the uh, equity in the hope of in the future being able to sell the equity so that you can destroy the money again because otherwise you have the inflation uh, and as soon as some companies are going bankrupt or, or if the value of the equity is decreasing that will result in uh, an expanded monetary base because suddenly the money is stuck in the system again it has no way to get back to its issue so it's it's a very dangerous game they're playing we have seen some of these uh, things historically. I have been writing a bit about the first paper money experiments in France, but th then it was blatant that it was going to fail quite quickly because the, the, the central bank in France in you know, the 18th century, they issued money and then they, they paid off debt with it. So it's not like they tried to, they were not, they were not buying um, bonds with the money, like the Federal Reserve is. They were straight up just uh, canceling all the debt with the money that they printed from thin air. Then it's just already from day one, that money is stuck out in the system. And then you have the, the inflation immediately. So I think we will see the inflation in the future, um, but it's very hard to say when it's hitting. It, it doesn't have to hit immediately just because, for example, M1 is expanding. It doesn't have to hit right now, but so someday it might very well hit quite hard. Could the process be gradual then suddenly or could it really come unexpectedly like i mean i, I really felt a, a pain felt uh, inflation you know not like you know like a real incremental incremental uh, I, I honestly don't know maybe stephanie has some input how, how she thinks yeah i think it's also very much related to the people's trust in the system and uh, less and less people trust the system and uh, get yeah, so I, I see that as a very important point on that. It's also psychological. It's not only the numbers, um, because it's also what value you attribute to the uh, euro or the US dollar to the fiat stuff. Mm. And, and this trust, it's, uh, I think it can be attributed also to looking at the Federal Reserve's, the, the assets and liabilities. If the assets are booked there, but it has a, a low underlying quality, if it's full of junk bonds, for example, the trust in the money will go down and that will cause uh, you know, inflation or pe people value the money less. Yeah. As long as the assets that they book on the, in the, on the balance sheet is strong, then it has not a, an immediate, it's no immediate inflationary effect. So, so just to give maybe one example, if the US government would to, were to issue more and more debt and they become ever higher in debt and this debt is on the on the asset side of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. The more debt the, the government has, the less likely it is that it will be able to pay it back with future tax base, that they confiscate the money in the future from people. And if it's not likely that they will be able to you know, pay back all the debt, then that makes the quality of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet bad. And then people lose trust in the money. Yeah. 
Yeah, or I mean, many people still think we have a gold standard and more and more people realize that this is not the case and that it's not backed by anything. And then they maybe realize, okay, maybe it's backed just by the taxpayer's money. And yeah, so here in Germany, definitely the situation that people are becoming more critical to this whole system. So I, and we also already have like increasing prices for consumer goods. So I just recently saw a post that, you know, the price of milk increased. So I definitely think that we all have see a higher inflation this year already. It's difficult to say how strong it is, but I can imagine that it will be already like in autumn, uh, a, a quite big inflation in, in, in contrast to the years we had so far. But yeah, only time will show. It very depends on, on the people's perception of money, basically. Okay, man, you, uh, you are very much interested in the ethics of all this, right? The, the, it, it, what, what right do they have to even do this that, kind of thing? That's always my core question. Uh, not only, you know, ethical, but I mean, the question of legitimacy and transparency. And, uh, you know, um, Stephanie, you pointed out in your article, uh, just in a side sentence, sort of for evidence on whether commercial banks may individually create money out of thin air, we may either look into the source code of the banking system or we'll look at empirical data, which is one ex example. The source code is unfortunately undisclosed, so we may only look at empirical data. So, you know, whatever angle we take, you know, whether you take the Bank for International Settlements, the Fed, the European Central Bank, it's... It's a self-appointed institution entity without any transparency whatsoever. The protocols are totally non-existent or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or not accessible, totally in intransparent. They're not accountable for anything. They even have not only diplomatic, but criminal immunity. I mean, where's the, you know, people always, you know, complain about injustice, but wh where, where's the, where's the outcry for the injustice when, when especially the laws and the regulations and uh, the, the the whole you know structure of the, the government the nation state um, inclusion with the central banks d derives its laws from an unjust actually non legitimate structure i mean where is the outcry of the people i'm asking myself you know really oh, the people, yeah the people don't understand it yet but this is already starting to change like also people like on the street who have like a basic job are starting to understand that that's, there's something wrong about that. And I think we didn't have this to such an extent in the last years. And there are also more and more people like speaking out and explaining how it works, like us actually, and the whole Bitcoin community. So there's a whole movement of disclosing how the system works and why it is uh, not to the benefit of the people essentially and um yeah so so we will have a great change in that in the perception and this will have incredible implications and more and more people are also going into bitcoin because of that and we are more and more going towards inflation we have no interest rates anymore on our savings accounts people <laughs> are just uh, thinking something is wrong here and for a reason and yeah that's just amplified now I, th I think this is one danger also that it is so complicated that people don't understand it. I don't understand the whole system. Just that Bitcoin is, it's not complicated as money, but the underlying things about Bitcoin, you have to spend a lot of hours as well to try to understand how does proof of work work and so on. So the comp that the, the monetary system today is so complicated that I think is dangerous in the long run as well. You have even the, the branch of Austrian economists not agreeing whether US dollar is credit or money. So if, if we don't really, if we are, we are struggling to understand maybe details of it, imagine just how it is for everyone else. And the people who work at the Federal Reserve, the ones who are making decisions, they're just humans as well. They, will, they probably have a really flawed understanding of what money is and they can make the wrong decisions. And a, a little bit what Kamen was saying that where is the outrage? Well, I think now there has, uh, there has been a, a a steady senior stream of income to the government from the from the central banks because uh, there hasn't been any large you know, default events yet, I guess. So the, the asset side on the Federal Reserve has still not had the, their share of haircuts is my assumption because when they have haircuts, when the value of the, those assets fall, 
well, then the capital on the balance sheet would be negative. And that's a negative cost that will be transferred to the taxpayers. So the, the, the government have, have only seen a positive stream of income so far, but it may be negative in, in a future crisis. And that someone has to foot the bill. And it's only one income that the government has, that's tax. Tax comes from us. So there might be more outcry in the future if people feel you know, defrauded in this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we can also um, go back again to the government bonds again. Um, Kevin, you were already like uh, talking about this and this is actually something that could be explored much more in detail because this is uh, mostly what the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is comprised of. And so what is happening? The um, government essentially uh, creates more and more bonds and gets the money for that in, and thereby in debts its own people. And I think it's very unlikely actually that all of that is paid back. And they have this, the tax payments where they get the money, but they, on top of that, they are already indebting the future tax payments. And this is kind of going on and on. And um, we can also like see this whole mechanism of what is in place there. So when they're giving out government bonds, um, in order to have a low interest rate, there must be a great demand. And since the Federal Reserve is buying up just all of the, not all, but many of the government bonds, they can um, have this interest rate low. And this has an influence on the whole system because this is considered a risk-free rate just because the government backs it. And therefore, the whole system is kind of influenced. And there are like so many tweaks in this whole system. And that's very, very, it's, it's a super deep rabbit hole. I think probably even deeper than Bitcoin. And um, it is not, it's actually impossible for a person without the background to understand it, just looking at the, at the, um, at the website of the central bank. So, yeah. Yeah, and uh, one interesting thing with this, they are buying government bonds. And so they're at the asset side of the balance sheet is just exploding with, for example, government bonds. And they also have, they say they have a plan to raise interest rates. That means that they have, on their asset side, they have securities with high duration. And the securities with high duration fall in value if you raise the interest rate. It's kind of conflict of interest also, that the day when the Federal Reserve is raising the interest rate back, the value of their own assets will fall. Mm -hmm. So they're really in a hard spot, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there you see exactly how the Federal Reserve and the government is working together. I mean, the Federal Reserve is even transferring their revenue to the government and then they're saying it's independent. So this also doesn't make sense. Yeah, all the revenue seems to be transferred. I saw this in your article and it's kind of, it's done also in a quiet, um, devious way that because they send the revenues every week then it always looks like they yeah they're just taking a little bit from the people if they were to send it every year then you, you will see this huge sum of money coming once a year uh, and you can see it in the balance sheet that it's actually a large cost in the capital now the capital looked very 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 small in the balance sheet because it's cleared every week it's just put to zero again yeah yeah, I was super surprised when I was reading it because I didn't expect that. And I was sending it to a friend, am I reading this correct? And yeah, so I never heard of this before, before I read it in their annual report. So in your conclusive um, part of your article, uh, Stephanie, you, okay, so you, you transitioned then to, to, to Bitcoin. Um, what, what would... Uh, because a lot of people talk about when, when, talk, when in connection with Bitcoin, they talk about the triple accounting system, uh, it, you know, it, versus the, the double entry bookkeeping. Why is that? Well, actually, I don't know exactly what I mean with triple accounting system. So maybe they understand that there is something back behind. Maybe email, email, you know better what I mean with that. Triple account. Mm. No, I know only about the conventional way to do it, that you have to put the double uh, on each, uh, each side. Yeah. I think they rather mean that there's something behind, like something back, because right now the fiat money is backed by future tax payments. 
And this is actually that the labor is used as, uh, as backing, which is the people. So humans are the backing of the fiat money. And I don't consider this as a very nice money that is not, it is not for the freedom of the people. And so it's uh, very relevant to have a different backing and which could be gold or Bitcoin. And I'm also going into this why gold has really great disadvantages um, because you are going into central centralization you need, and you need to trust. And this is not the case for Bitcoin because you can send the payments over distance by yourself. You can do self custody. And this is like the absolute crucial thing of Bitcoin in contrast to gold. But I definitely see that we have to go to a system where it is not backed by the government who has like total control of the, or, uh, of the people and a great amount of control of the financial system because they're like working together with the Federal Reserve. It's just an incredible concentration of power. I have one, uh, I was on this value of Bitcoin conference, did a, a panel discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Stefan Levera mentioned uh, central banks event or perhaps buying Bitcoin in the future. So what, what is what are your guys take on this? Will you see a, a chance that they will buy, buy Bitcoin just to stay by gold or is this, uh, would, would that be, you know, contributing to their own destruction in a way? Yeah, that, that was really a good question. So on the one side, they said they can, they did not yet because they would need to disclose it, but maybe they did and just did not disclose it. So we don't know if they already did it. And now we can ask ourselves um, whether it is reasonable for them to do so. I mean, Bitcoin is the alternative to their system. And this is why they don't like Bitcoin, because they can exercise a, a tremendous amount of uh, control and power with the system and also extract wealth to the people they want because they give them cheap credit eventually. Um, and they cannot do this with, with Bitcoin anymore. There is not the ability to create money or debt money out of thin air. Um, and so they, they don't like Bitcoin and I think they will do as much as they can to prevent uh, of Bitcoin like rising up. Um, I'm curious how far they will go. And I hope we have more and more people entering the Bitcoin space and to stand in for the Bitcoin and the freedom that comes with it. And, um, but nevertheless, I think it's totally possible that they are buying Bitcoin. I, I do think so, actually, because they are not dumb. They un I think definitely that they understand what Bitcoin is and that many people are using it. And it's always um, a good idea to ba balance out your own risks by saying, OK, my system, maybe it breaks down. Maybe the people don't trust it. And then I have these Bitcoins and I still have some wealth. So I, I definitely see that, that that's very possible. And I think many people do it. So Elon Musk, for example, he, he bought Bitcoin. I saw that he said that on, on Twitter and he's, well, let's say, high up in the, in the corporations world. And I think many people that are high up are also just buying Bitcoin, although they're actually like quite entwined with the old system. Yeah, the different institutions are, you know, after Paul Tudor Jones, uh, allegedly, I mean, I don't, I didn't know him before that, a uh, prominent hedge fund manager and, uh, you know, really like established uh, for decades. So if these institutions and, you know, other, you know, pension funds, uh, family offices, they start accumulating. But I mean, if I were them, I would do it in an inconspicuous way. Uh, and, uh, you know, you talked about, uh, you just asked the question, you know, whether central banks are doing it already they're definitely doing it but i think they have to be really careful to do it incrementally very inconspicuously otherwise it will maybe you think you don't think it would trigger like a chain reaction of uh, they don't they, you know to prevent the the all you know the, the exponential i don't know rise or mass mass adoption or well i mean if the people know that they're doing this then this will get a lot of publicity and marketing for but Bitcoin. So if they do it, they have to do it in secret. Uh, I guess the, the source code of their, uh, the software they're using when they issue currency, it's likely closed source also. So of course, in, in some countries, they might be totally open about what they're doing, that how much money they are issuing or how much 
credit they're issuing and what they're buying, what, what is on the assets, etc. But in some, you know, countries that don't care little for the rule of law, why wouldn't they? There, they would just print the money and purchase Bitcoin or gold or whatever. They, they don't have to care about disclosing everything uh, correctly, because even the, the politicians in those countries are not uh, their thugs, basically. So yeah, I, I guess there's also a probability that some central banks are buying in secret. Um, if they're short-sighted, if they have a short-sighted interest, this, I guess, is what they are doing. But in, in their long-term interest, if Bitcoin succeeds, that will drain them from the same rush they're making, the, the profit that they're doing every week and they're clearing to the government. So the, the government has to also understand that if they're ordering the central banks to purchase Bitcoin, that is, you know, it's a bit like funding your own destruction in the long term. So yeah, maybe it, maybe it has happened, but then it is about very short-sighted decisions, in my opinion. Well, I mean, if they have no other choice because they know the people will convert to Bitcoin and they know that they cannot uphold the system, then it's actually, I wouldn't call it short-sighted necessarily. Okay, so you, maybe then they have to increase other taxes to compensate because they will lose the tax of Sena Russian. Then they have to instead, you know, raise other taxes and face those problems instead. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we can we can never know for sure. Yeah, yeah it's really important to remind ourselves uh, the the core of fiat money is about the monopolistic production of money with with the parasitic senior Raj, right? With the rent seeking taxes, uh, that's that's the point. They have the monopoly on on money production and tax collection, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, Sinirosh, people, even economists or even people who study economics, they don't know this word, Sinirosh. People don't know that the central banks are collecting, that the revenues are just purchasing power taken from the people. Um, they're not providing any service. They just, they just confiscate this purchasing power from people by by uh, issuing this these currencies and they purchase all these uh, securities that has an income um, in them it's our money that they're taking yeah but then the cantillian effect would then here uh play perfectly into this right because uh it takes it takes it takes some time till this effect you know um the the what do you call it like the yeah the, the debasement effect you know takes effect and and the people, the, the masses of the people, uh, they are the ones who are, you know, paying for the, for the debasement, right? Yeah, I think it works in, uh, in two ways actually. The way this senioros, the way this tax is collected, is that the poor people have a large, proportionally larger part of their, their savings in the regular currency, so they are proportionally larger the tax base that the senioros is based on, and then when the senioros is taken. Um, and, and the new money is coming out to the system. Those mon that money is also not distributed equally. So then it's politically well connected, can perhaps attain it uh, more quickly, etc. So there's like a double hit towards people who are not connected and who are not perhaps caring so much about uh, economics and their finances. So yeah, it's quite destructive for regular people. Yeah, exactly. So when you have a lot of wealth, you can just, uh, let's say you have a lot, uh, some houses and then you get a credit to you do some speculation. You put one of your houses as a security, so you get a super cheap credit and then you put these, uh, this money or the step money um, into stocks. And since many people are doing this, the demand for stocks rises, the prices go up and you have, uh, you might have even a higher uh, revenue than um, the interest rates you have to pay on the on the credit and this is the leverage effect and rich people can do this poor people cannot do this because they don't get a cheap credit so this is the huge difference so how do we transition to bitcoin <laughs> what do you think is the process of transitioning i mean uh, you know you talked about like loss of faith loss of trust in the system uh do you see like an era coming uh you know in the near future where people uh, you know in in massive numbers 
not only hodl but but start um, developing a circular economy i mean that's my personal vision that more and more merchants just start adopting it just just incrementally like even if it's just small transactions uh, but you know still it's got to be you got a way you know way to go with user friendliness and and user interface and user experience and you know the simplicity of it do you do you see something like that coming so they always say gradually and then suddenly, and I definitely see that. So we will have a very strong pressure towards uh, Bitcoin adoption when we have more inflation. And when we reach hyperinflation, which means like super strong inflation, then there is a strong pressure and I do see that coming. I um, still see it as possible that the government just will just prohibit Bitcoin and gold, but right now, I see so many people standing up and don't wanting to have the liberties uh, like reduced. So essentially everything is a function of the choices of the people as a whole. But only if like a, a small part already um, stands in for their freedom. That counts a lot already. Yeah, and I would like also to add that it's not, it's not a silver bullet, but jurisdictional arbitrage, I think, uh, is quite, <laughs> it is part of the way Bitcoin succeeds also, that if if a local government becomes too harsh and they ban too much, or they, they mistreat their you know, subjects too much, then it's possible to escape from that locality with your Bitcoins without them being confiscated. Historically, we saw people trying to flee, you know, very, socialist experiments and, and their wealth got confiscated by the policemen, by the military on the roads, etc. This happened uh, even in the 18th century, 19th century, when people tried to flee borders with their silver and gold. But now it's much, much easier to actually take your wealth. So there will be a little bit at least more competition among, among these uh, jurisdictions that, okay, I want to attract capital, I want to attract smart individuals, so I have maybe perhaps a little, little bit of better laws for Bitcoin to attract those people. It's not, a, as I said, it's not a silver bullet because uh, it might be the case that all uh, jurisdictions clamp down on Bitcoin also. We cannot just hope that it will not happen. Uh, I think a nice treatment with regards to Bitcoin from the government is just a bonus. We cannot see it as a given. Yeah, I mean, we had a global lockdown now. I think if I would have told this uh, people like half a year ago, they would just laugh at me. So I definitely think that they can try to push things through on a like kind of global basis. But yeah, I mean, there are countries who didn't do a, a lockdown, but most did. So Sweden was very good in that. And um, yeah, so I definitely also see that there is a competition. Maybe more and more governments are realizing this now. Yeah. Yeah, jurisdictional arbitrage competition, like who is going to be the first one? I think once, you know, one or two or a couple of of these different jurisdictions or countries start, uh, you know, not only accumulating, but really literally circumventing, um, you know, the SWIFT system with Bitcoin or, or using it as a sort of a reserve currency. And eventually it will be, I'm totally convinced it will be, we will become the global reserve currency as Raul Paul also said in his, one of his interviews. So uh, it's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen simultaneously with institutions coming in, hedge fund, pension funds. Uh, yeah. So, um, Emil, you were talking about whether the fiat money is debt money or is, is or debt or is it money? And I would actually call it debt money because it's backed by debt or by future tax payments. So I would say it's both. And I actually saw this on so many discussions. Some said it's like this, and some said like this. Yeah. And they both had the truth, if you like. Um, and you have to bring this together then. Yeah, and for me, it's not clear. I, I try to understand more about this, these views, but I have not landed in one camp, you know, indefinitely. You know, even Mises had one. Mises would uh, say that US dollar is uh, money, you know, and then we have the, the more Mangarian view would probably argue that today's US dollar would be this credit, uh, ir irregular credit. So it's very, I think it's very, it's, it's good to try to understand it, but it's not clear at all. 
Yeah, um, well, I think it really depends on your definitions of money yeah. and debt eventually. So uh, my article lays out that this new money that is created is uh, during debt creation. So this, this would, and also it's backed by, by future tax payments, which justifies it to call it debt. But they also create this money when they purchase assets. So it's actually not only with the debt. And on the other side, you can use this money to buy goods, which is a medium of exchange eventually. Uh, this, this has always been my view of money. Money for me is a medium of exchange. It's the thing that you use to circumvent, you know, the, the lack of coincidence of wants, the uh, inconvenience of barter. So I kind of like this definition of money that it's a medium of exchange because uh, then it, it is not, it is a not, not so collectivist, you know, term because I don't like the people tell me what money is. I can use anything as money. But just that not everything is equally good as money. Yeah. Um, US dollar I can use as money. Gold, you know, can be used as money. But it's just uh, if I were to use uh, my computer as money, that I would lose a lot of purchasing power because it's it sucks as money. So yeah, there will be these discussions also among Austrians. They're fun to follow. Uh, I think all all of these branches are right on the general the general view about how things work. So. Yeah. So we, we don't have to focus too much on small, very, very small differences. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, your yeah, Kempstorf had a really nice uh, talk on the value of Bitcoin conference on what, what is money or how, how did it develop and why gold. And uh, gold was chosen for one reason because it's like scarce and there is like this new form, um, new metal that is also super scarce. I, I think I forgot the name was rhodium or something, which yeah. could have also been used as money then, but it's just, it hasn't been discovered in the last, uh, just in the last two centuries or something. And gold is known for um, like thousands of years. So this is a great difference. And this is all from the physical stuff we have. And this is also the, ma the magic, actually, he, he explained that the people cho chose gold as, uh, as the metal to use as a barter. And by just analyzing it, it is also the most reasonable to use as a barter. And now we have Bitcoin, which is like virtual and co co bringing a whole different dynamic into it. Mm. I, I like Saifedin Amos's, uh, you know, analysis also in re regards to gold and also rhodium, because when you use the stock to flow analysis, you realize that, for example, rhodium might be even more scarce than gold. But okay, it's not, the market cap of rhodium is very low. It's not used as money. So why is that then? Well, it's because if people were to use rhodium as money, the price of it would increase. And then the production that the producers would start to mass produce it, or they would try to mass produce it. So the stock to flow of rhodium then would decrease to under that of gold. I think this is the, the dynamic that people have to understand that it's not only about how you know many grams of gold is out there or how many grams of rhodium it's about when one has become money how easy is it to dilute uh, the added annual production how large is that in relation to the to the total stock so th this is what i find valuable about this concept to think about it in terms of uh, stock to flow yeah yeah, stock to flow is definitely a game changer to understand what, when money is truly valuable and stock to flow is essentially a measure for scarcity. Yeah. So this is the most important aspect of money. And it, I mean, this is not the case for fiat money. So if you would say, okay, scarcity is a necessity, necessity for something to be called money, then you would like need to cancel fiat out. <laughs> yeah, because, because any stock to flow for fiat, it's a very, you know, what, what you cannot trust it because even if the stock is high and the flow is kept low, the, U, the printed US dollar might be kept low for a, <clears throat> a long time. Then the stock to flow looks very good, it looks high. But that, since the flow is uh, it's digital, they, they can uh, increase the flow tomorrow. So we cannot trust ever any stock to flow of the fiat money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Bitcoin is really unique with its absolute scarcity, the difficulty adjustment, you know, the predetermined supply schedule. Uh, it's a unique beast for itself. Um, so, yeah, any other final thoughts or uh, directions, um, perspectives? Uh, before we wrap it up? 
Well, yes. So um, with my article, I kind of like uh, laid the basis to understand the cure and fiat system. And I will publish more and more articles in the future, which like explain the implications of the system. And I do think that it's very valuable to understand the system that we have right now to um, understand first why Bitcoin is important and second to understand the impact of the system and actually power and, con and control structure of this whole system, the implications on the economy and on the people and why we have to change that. And I think that is super valuable. And yeah, so more articles will come in the future. I will probably also hold a talk at the Value of Bitcoin conference. And yeah, so uh, spread the word about that, uh, educate people on Bitcoin or general on, on money. Um, also, it's so, you know, I was studying uh, economics uh, at university, um, not as a mayor, but as part of my studies. And I, we were never like really going into money now. And so this is really important to change that. And uh, yeah, so spread the word what money really is, what, why we need it. I mean, there's the saying, we shall not talk about money. I mean, of course we have to, it's the engine of the whole economy. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this session. And Emmy, thank you very much for your super interesting questions. I really learned a lot again. And um, yeah, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And uh, I, will, I look forward to the future articles as well. Look forward to learn more about this, uh, this system. And perhaps we can do a, another session in the future, who knows? Hopefully. Yeah, it would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both of you. Uh, again, uh, Stephanie, uh, your articles at medium.com slash at Stephanie von Jam. I'm going to put in the show notes. And um, Emil Sandstedt, the author of Money Dethrone, a historical journey, available Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And you can follow them both on Twitter. And yeah, really enjoyed this. My, me and my listeners learned a lot and hope we can repeat this in the near, near future. Thanks so much. Looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> so what do you guys think? I really enjoyed this talk. I'm sure you and many other listeners, followers, have really uh, learned a lot uh, from these discussions. Uh, extremely knowledgeable uh, econom Austrian economists, Bitcoiners, um, Stephanie von Jan and, and uh, Emil Sandstedt. Make sure you follow them. Make sure you subscribe to my channel, please, to my podcast platforms, retweet it, reshare it, like it, whatever you do, you would support me in any shape or form. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, buy some Bitcoin and uh, you know, really dig into the rabbit hole. The articles are in German and English now, by now uh, from Stephanie von Jan and get also the book of, of Emil Sandstedt. You can follow me on Twitter, uh, Twitter handle is Kvandavani. Make sure you follow Emil and Stephanie too. And yeah, we really it's really important that we understand the root causes of all the symptoms uh, and you know the problems we're encountering, the pain and suffering and the evaluation of money, the built the trillions and trillions that are being printed, what consequence or effect does it have on on the you know on the average people out there, um, on on the you know, on humanity, uh, where does it come from? What does it mean for, you know, for society, civilization as a whole? These are the fundamental questions we need to answer and about, you know, ethical questions, legitimate questions. Do the central banks, European Central Bank, Federal Reserve, in privately owned entities, totally intransparent, non-accountable, uh, 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 and, 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 you know, totally uh, obscure and secret, um, yeah. their operations, their they're whatever they do it's it's you know they're criminally immune so i think we need to you know finally um ask the ask the overdue questions uh what does it mean for all of us where where we go from here and why bitcoin thank you so much for listening and for support